This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network, and welcome to our 2017 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma. Our webinars are also brought to you by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The goal of our webinar series is to share guidelines-based information with you that is relevant to your life and your practice. This series helps Allergy and Asthma Network live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. This webinar is titled Allergy and Asthma Student Health Care Plans, What Providers, School Nurses, and Parents Want to Know. We will be looking at four different types of student plans and discuss the roles of providers, parents, and school nurses in a collaborative, student-centered approach to health in the school setting. I will be your speaker today. I know many of you in the audience today, and for those of you that don't know me, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I began working as a school nurse in the early 1990s and have worked in elementary and secondary schools in both public and private settings. I've been a school nurse teacher, as well as executive director of the New York Statewide School Health Services Center before heading to the National Association of School Nurses as Director of Nursing Education. I'm currently pleased to hold the position as Director of Education for Allergy NASMA Network, where I work with a wonderful team on educational initiatives as well as resource development. Let's begin our topic today by looking at a scenario that could happen in any elementary school on any given day. Olivia, a second grade student, tugs on her teacher's pocket and says, my mouth feels hot and it's getting hard to breathe. The teacher looks at Olivia, whose lips are swelling, and she's beginning to gasp for breath. The teacher has moments to react. Does he or she know what to do? This is a definitely an issue in our schools today when our children very rarely have anaphylactic emergencies in the nurse's office in front of the nurse. So we have to make sure that our school population is prepared to react in the event of an emergency. We need to have plans of care in place. We need not only to prevent exposures to allergens and plan for that, we also need to educate staff, students, and families, and we have to make sure everyone in the school knows how to respond in an emergency. It takes a shared responsibility to create plans for students at school. In the school setting, the school nurse will be taking the leadership role in health-related planning, but certainly there's a circle of care that includes the provider and the parents. There are four major types of health care plans that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be looking at individualized health care plans, or IHPs, emergency care plans, or ECPs, Section 504 plans, and individualized education plans, which are IEPs. This is a little bit like alphabet soup at times, but we'll make sure that we differentiate which plan we're talking about at different times. When it comes to asthma care, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology partnered with the National Association of School Nurses to develop SAMPRO, which is a school asthma management program. And they talk about having a circle of support for our children in, in schools. And this is a great graphic, and it applies to what we're talking about today as well. So what you have is the child at the middle of everything we do. And the child is surrounded not only by their clinician, but also by the school nurse and family. And that's all within the context of the bigger community. And today we're thinking about the school community. And we're going to start our chats about care plans, looking at individualized health care plans. An IHP is a nursing document. It's written in nursing language for nurses to use to, to develop and to follow as their plan of care. It's important as we differentiate these plans is to realize not only what language they should be written in, but also uh, who, who they're directed towards. But an IHP is a document that will really guide the care that a nurse in the school setting is going to perform. And it's really important to write individualized health care plans. It's certainly a professional standard of school nursing. 
uh, in the book, The Scope and Standards of School Nursing Practice, which is put out by the American Nurses Association and the National Association of School Nurses. It outlines in several places the importance of individualized healthcare plans. And one is in the section of roles and responsibility. And there it states, the nurse alone or with others develops plans unique to the school setting. Many people do not understand uh, exactly what happens in the school setting, but the school nurse knows that well. And that's another great reason for the school nurse to be one taking the leadership role in developing care plans. And then planning is standard four of the scope and standards. And that says that the school nurse develops an individualized plan in partnership with the student and others. It's important to realize, too, that when most school nurses have come to school nursing from the hospital setting or an inpatient type of setting. And certainly we had care plans for every patient we cared for. The, the care plans that we're seeing in school nursing are larger and a little more involved, but you also have so much more time to work with a student and to develop a plan of care that can last for 180 days instead of 24 to 48 hours. So I think that's one of the reasons why if you've made the transition from an inpatient setting to a school setting, you might be surprised at how much more involved an individualized health care plan is. This is one template for an individualized health care plan. This has been developed by the National Association of School Nurses. And I wanted to show you this mostly to show you how the nursing process or the basics of nurse, how nurses work fit into care planning. Uh, certainly when you start to do a care plan, you're going to bring that assessment data in. And that's going to be the upset, upset, uh, subjective and objective data. You're going to then make a nursing diagnosis. You're going to set goals. You're going to have outcomes. You're going to look at the implementation of the interventions that you identify that the student needs. And you're going to want to be evaluating. And that right there is your nursing process. But we're going to talk about these in a little bit more depth so that we can see how this all fits together when you're writing a nursing care plan. So the IHP is defined as the nurse's plan of care for a student with any kind of special need. And uh, so, so writing an IHP is going to direct nursing care, and it's going to be written in nursing language for nurses to use, as I've already pointed out. But it's going to include those details of care. What equipment do you need and what teaching needs to happen? So this might be, in, if you're looking at an asthma plan, you might be thinking about uh, the child's nebulizer, the tubing, the mask, what, what the kinds of things you need. And then how would you detail that nebulizer treatment? And, and make sure that you've got it so that if another nurse were to walk into your shoes, they would know exactly how to care for that student. NASN has a position statement on individualized health care plans, and you can find this on their website at nasn.org. But in that, within that statement, they say that writing an IHP meets nursing regulatory requirements and professional standards. It's really important to realize that it's not only your responsibility to write these, but it's part of the profession and part of who you are as a registered professional school nurse. The other thing is the fact that it is a nursing responsibility means that writing an IHP cannot ever be delegated to an unlicensed individual. If you have a health aid in your office, and many of you are going, I had a health aid because so many school nurses are practicing in relative isolation with very little assistance. But if you did have one, you could never delegate writing a care plan to someone who's not a nurse. These are nursing responsibilities to, to carry out. Uh, they're a cornerstone of nursing practice at all levels of nursing. But also, these should be reviewed at least yearly to make sure that they're still appropriate. Uh, a, a nursing care plan should be a fluid document. It should change as the child's changing. And as your education uh, that you're performing is, is sinking in, you might be ready to teach a different task. So you would then be able to say, you evaluate your care and say, yes, well, all, the student now can use their inhaler. Now I want to teach them how to do belly breathing or another kind of uh, activity. So your care plan is going to change over time. 
What are some of the benefits of writing care plans? Again, it demonstrates that standard of school nursing practice. This is all from NASN in their, in their care, um, position statement. It documents that nursing process. It provides a legal documentation. It's going to take what you've determined as a clinician, as a, as a professional nurse, what you see as appropriate care, you're documenting that and you're stating that it's your intention to provide that level of care for that student. And the other thing, when we talk about all these other care plans, uh, one of your I interventions in an individualized health care plan might be to write that emergency care plan or to support an IEP or individualized education plan. So that gets all incorporated into the overarching umbrella of the individualized health care plan. As we talked before, you're going to see your nursing process come to life in this IHP. So at first, when you're going to sit down to write one, you're going to be looking at subjective and objective data. Then, and, and that basically means you're going to listen to what the student has to say. How, if we're looking at anaphylaxis, how does it feel to them? I had one student at one point who, um, adorable kindergartner, and he would come to me and he would say, um, I actually, I said to him as I was writing his first IHP, I said, okay, Riley, if you, were experiencing an allergic reaction. How would you, what words would you use to tell me? And this adorable little voice said, I would tell you that my mouth feels hot. And I thought at that moment, wow, I could just see 12 kids in the room. This little quiet kindergartner comes and stands next to me and says, my mouth feels hot. I might at that point say, well, good, honey, go get a drink of cold water. I'll be with you in a minute. But the fact that I asked for that subjective information would now cue me in and have me say, this child may be entering anaphylaxis. He needs my attention immediately. And again, if you're writing an IHP, then if another nurse stepped into your shoes, or if this child, I actually had it happen where a child with a very complex uh, care needs moved and they just pulled it, pulled their records. And I had stamped on the IHP that it was part of the permanent health record and it went with them. And this was a child where day one, his next school nurse needed to know how to care for him. And the IHP went so that nurse would know what to do. So again, that subjective data and then your objective data is all the things you can measure. Uh, for an asthmatic, it might be your, your peak flow. It might be just vital signs. Uh, it might be if a child does um, uh, pulse oximeter readings regularly. That would all be the objective data that you could use. But uh, assessment is defined as a systematic, dynamic way to collect and analyze data about a client, and it's the first step in delivering nursing care. And I think the overarching question here is, what's the big picture for this student? Without collecting all this data, we can't assess what the child needs. So basically, your data is going to include healthcare provider orders and data, but it's also going to in in incorporate every aspect of this child's experience, from their physiological data to psychological, sociocultural, spiritual, economic, and lifestyle factors. These aren't documented on the IHP. But, there, but the IHP is written with all of these in mind. The next step is nursing diagnosis. Uh, I, nursing diagnosis is different than medical diagnosis. Uh, the medical diagnosis would be, this child has asthma. Whereas the nursing diagnosis, I always, it, it, this isn't like an official uh, definition, but I always like to think of the medical diagnosis as saying, this is what you have. And the nursing diagnosis says, okay, here's how you live with it. So when we're thinking about nursing diagnosis, this is another standard of practice from the scope and standards. And it's, it's, it's standard number two. And it says the school nurse analyzes assessment data to determine a diagnosis or issue. And this is that formalized statement of the problem or an important health focus. And I think here we can, we can boil it down to the question of what are this student's health needs? And this good basis is going to provide that foundation for the selection of outcomes and interventions. You, you can't know where you're going unless you know what you're facing. And the nursing diagnosis helps with that. 
The nurse, North American Nursing Diagnosis Association, or NANDA, defines nursing diagnosis as a clinical judgment about an individual family or community experiences responses to actual or potential health problems or life processes. A nursing diagnosis provides the basis for the selection of nursing interventions to achieve outcomes, and this is a real important part of the definition, for which the nurse has accountability. So I think that's a real important part to keep in mind. Uh, there's uh, domains within NANDA, and uh, these are the 13 domains that uh, are were within the uh, 2012 uh, nursing diagnoses. And basically, you could fit almost anything into any of these categories. So it basically uh, covers things. And uh, and there's a wonderful book. Uh, the it, there's a NANDA book on on nursing diagnosis, and it lists all the nursing diagnosis codes. And I loved having that book with me while I was writing IHPs because it really helped me frame the nursing diagnoses. These aren't things you have to make up. There's a book out there to help you with that. The next question we really want to approach is, what do you want to help this student achieve? When we're gonna talk about goals, goals are defined as something that the, that the student and family are trying to do or achieve. I want to make sure that as you're thinking about the goals you're going to set for writing an individualized health care plan, uh, and, and if, if I have uh, providers or parents listening, I want you mostly to understand that uh, what, what goes into a care plan, but we're definitely going to be approaching things that are aimed at providers and, and, and families, not just nurses. But I know that we have a very, very uh, large school nursing uh, uh, listenership today. So I really want to approach things so that they have that great concept about what the care plans are. But as a parent, I'd want to know what's going into a care plan that my child was going to have as well. And if I was a provider, I'd want to know how to support the process. So again, your goals are something that are student and family centric. I want you to keep in mind, these aren't nursing goals. These are student goals patient goals. And you want to make sure that you can achieve set goals that are actually achievable. Uh, you don't want to set a goal that is so far above what this child is capable of. Uh, you want to make sure your goals are achievable and you can think about long-term goals and short-term goals. And you're going to hear me say the word collaborate over and over today because it's so important. Because if you don't know the goals that the student and the parents or guardians have, then you're not going to be able to set effective goals. If you're thinking of a goal being, you know, only something about uh, where their peak flow reading is going to land or, or uh, something that's more clinical, and all that student wants as a goal is to play soccer with asthma, then you're going to have a disconnect. So certainly you can tie goals together, but you really need to collaborate talking to the student, talking to the parent or guardian, and making sure that you you're, have their goals in mind. When you're setting goals, you need to describe a behavior that's measurable, that shows progress towards outcomes that are identified. And I encourage you to write SMART goals. And if you Google SMART goals, you can find all sorts of information. If I go into too much about SMART goals, I could do a whole nother webinar today. But a SMART goal is measurable, it's time bound, and, and there's a lot of aspects to writing SMART goals, but I totally encourage you to look up writing SMART goals. Your outcomes are going to be individualized. That you don't write one, you can have a template for an emergency, for I mean for an individualized health care plan, but but it's got to be individualized. It's right there in the title. So you want to make sure that your outcomes are very specific to that child. This is true patient-centered care. And that is certainly something we all want. So your outcomes are what is your vision for this student and their family? Things you want to keep in mind as you're looking at outcomes are, are they culturally appropriate? What's the time estimation for completion? And consider continuity of care. Consider when you're thinking about outcomes, that, that whole range of care. If you have a student in fifth grade who's going to go the next year to a middle school in sixth grade, then you want to be thinking about that transition. And you want to make sure that their care is, is continued 
as they head to the middle school and that their care is uh, is relevant to what you've been doing. So now you've got all your outcomes figured out, but now you have to get there. So you have to have some interventions. So what do you need to do as a nurse to receive to reach those desired outcomes for the student? You want to define your steps. What do you need to do? It's like it's like having a great GPS, but now you do have to drive the car to get there. So these would include treatments, equipment, education, any kind of coping skills that the child might need for their for their health condition, uh, emergency care planning, and all the time you want to think about care coordination. And this is one of the the landmarks of NASN's framework for 21st century nurse school nursing is care coordination and uh, individualized health care plans are just a key uh, when considering care coordination. And now evaluating. You want to make sure that you look at the effectiveness of the strategies that you've you've put in place and, and that you've done. And you're going to be using ongoing assessment data. And I, I think, you know, you want to make sure, have you met your goals? But I think nurses are so good at this that it's like, okay, so you really should sit down and review the plan the individualized healthcare plan at least annually. And I attended when I was in uh, both uh, uh, elementary and secondary settings, I tended to do it in like the third week of January. Because if you're in a secondary setting, ex exams are going on. And that was always like the nicest week of the year because it was pretty quiet. So I always set time then to review my individualized healthcare plans. Uh, if you're in an elementary school, uh, unless you're battling an output of uh, an, uh, an epidemic of the flu, that can tend to be a kind of quiet time. So it's really a good time to look. But nurses, I know you're out there evaluating continually. I mean, if you give a student uh, their inhaler, you're immediately evaluating, did the child get relief? If, you're, if you go through an episode of anaphylaxis, you're going to be talking to the teacher and talking to your school administrator to say, okay, how did it go and what should we do better the next time? So I know nurses are great evaluators, but I do encourage you to be sure that you're looking at your care plans at least annually. Now, this is a template from an individualized health care plan. This is from a commercial book, and I am not endorsing you, you run out and buy this book. And the other thing is you can't yet because it's still in process. Uh, years and years and years ago, I, I got to know the uh, wonderful people at Sunrise River Press. Uh, Martha Arnold was a school nurse who owned this um, publishing company and uh, with her family. and and basically. It started in an, a one red book. And if anybody's listening, you'll know exactly what I mean when I say the red IHB book. And then a purple one was added. And then it was revised into a very large uh, publication with software. And it's being revised again and updated for 2017. And this will be coming out soon because these people are not only... Uh, I think wonderful, wonderful uh, nursing professionals, also their friends. And I said, can I show off one of your new templates? And they said, yes, I could. So the, the reference for the book is an individualized healthcare plan for the school nurse, a comprehensive resource for school nursing management of health conditions. And what we've got here is just an example of an individualized healthcare plan. You'll see demographic information at the top. Uh, it's really important to make sure you get student numbers and birth dates into individualized healthcare plans because I've had students with the same name and it was not a common name. So be sure you're getting those things in there. And uh, and this is so you've got your demographic information at the top, and then this is just one. Uh, example of one nursing diagnosis for asthma. And, uh, and they named the, they, they created this for me and they named the students Susie Q. And, uh, and the, the nurse, um, the issue here is an impaired gas exchange, which of course is what happens in asthma. Uh, the assessment data is left blank because you, that would be unique just to Susie. But for a nursing diagnosis, uh, and, and this is one of the NAND type, uh, nursing diagnoses, is an impaired gas exchange related to airway inflammation, bronchoconstriction, and excessive mucus production due to asthma. 
It lists the interventions you're going to do. So the first thing that the school nurse is going to do is obtain and hand on, have on hand an asthma action plan from the identified healthcare provider and use that to build an IHP, an emergency action plan, and 504 plans. Another intervention is that the school nurse is going to monitor availability of, of prescribed medications and, and devices and make sure she's got them with her and in the health office for emergencies, bus and field trips. So you can see that these are things that you do all the time in the school. And the outcome, they're going to want to see that Susie is going to demonstrate good asthma control. And then they define it. And you're going to want to define that carefully. And you want to say, within the next six weeks, we're going to see improved participation in school activities. There's that measure, that within six weeks. And you can even put a date down if you're really brave. But, uh, but this is just one example of an individualized health care plans. Some school districts have their own, and there's certainly other templates out there that are available. So when you're developing an IHP, providers, school nurses, and the parent and family all have a role in care plan development. You providers, you're going to want to make sure that you get those medical orders prepared uh, when, when a student is, is coming. Very often, uh, students, especially with allergies and asthma, will go to the doctor shortly before school begins. And if you can make sure that the parent, that the parent leaves with medical orders in their hands for the school and provide the school with the forms that they need, because they need to have a form for uh, administering medication. They need, uh, if it's a student with an allergy, they might need to have a, a form for uh, the food service to make sure that they can have a food substitution for their allergy. But you're going to want to make sure that you know what forms the parents need and make sure that they leave with them and then tell them they're actually supposed to close that circle and get it to the school. You're going to want to make sure that you're educating the student and the parent and family about uh, their asthma management during the day at school as well as at home. And then communicate with the school as needed. Uh, I can't think of too many school nurses that would ever, ever mind a provider calling and saying, I saw, you know, Jimmy today and he wasn't really exhibiting really great inhaler technique. Could you work on that with him? I think most school nurses would love to know what their kids need and what their provider sees. School nurses, you should be consulting with the provider, the student, and the parent, and write that IHP with input from everyone. Uh, you want to make sure you're keeping the student at the center of the IHP, and you want to evaluate and revise the plan regularly. And for you parents that are out there or family members that are caregivers, you want to make sure you're providing a great health history to the school. Nobody knows your child like you do. And you want to make sure that uh, you let them know, for students with anaphylaxis or asthma, you know, when was the last time they had a, an issue? You know, what did it look like? Was it more severe than the one before? You know, what was the outcome from that? You also need now to deliver the needed forms and medications to school that the provider prescribed. So again, we need to close that circle. And the next thing I have on here really could have been put on all of them, and that's to develop a trusting relationship with the school staff. We used to, uh, I, I, I was a school nurse for years at the desk, and this wasn't so much a problem with allergies and asthma, but there was some rather inflammatory things on the, um, on the Diabetes Association website way, way back when. And, uh, and, and it basically said, you know, you've got to go into that school and fight for what your child needs because they're not going to want to do it. And it's, and, and parents would come in and they'd just be, have this chip on their shoulder. And I'd look at them and I'd say, I want your child to do well as much as you do. Let's start from a spot of saying, what does your student need? And let's work together from there. So really work to develop a trusting relationship. Going to school assuming they want to help you because 99 times out of 100, everybody just wants what's best for your child. And make sure you're communicating regularly. If you have a student with asthma and they woke up not feeling well or they're coughing, give the school nurse a call in the morning and say, you know, you might see uh, Brianna. She is She's really struggling today. And that really helps the school nurse so that she's prepared. She may even go find Brianna in, in, in a quiet moment. Not that those exist that often, but, uh, but it, it's certainly uh, something to make sure that communication is key. 
I have a couple of do's and don'ts for writing individualized health care plans. Uh, for school nurses, prioritize which students need care plans. Uh, I, I, I've gotten into arguments with a few school nurses here and there who said that every child with a chronic condition needs a care plan. And while that is obviously would be the most amazingly wonderful thing, I haven't met a school nurse yet who has time to do that. So you think about what child needs the care plan. You're going to want to use your nursing diagnoses when you write. If you're not comfortable with them, consider finding someone who is or getting a book, but really use nursing diagnoses. It will frame how you think in a really great way. Use your outcomes as your North Star. Your outcomes are pretty much uh, your, your GPS in nursing care. They're going to help you get to where you want to go. And then evaluate as you go through the school year, but do plan a formal evaluation time. And not only review the IHP, but date it that you reviewed the IHP. Uh, one of my first nursing professors said, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. And this is just one of those great things that when you're documenting plans of care, that you also document that you reviewed it. Okay, a couple of, of care plan don'ts. Don't write a 20-page care plan. Now, I, I'm one of these people. I'm kind of a care plan geek. I love writing care plans. Uh, I, I realize that there aren't too many of me around in that respect. But if you said to me, Sally, could you write me a great uh, allergy? and a I've got a student with allergy and asthma. Could you write me a care plan? I literally could write you a beautiful 14 karat gold, 20 page care plan. And you would never have the time to do what's in it. And you may not have the equipment to do what's in it. So please, when you're writing care plans, remember that you're responsible to deliver the care that you've documented in the plan. So write what you can do. And don't forget to include the student and family in the care plan writing process. And don't hesitate to talk to a colleague if you feel like you need support. Uh, one fun story about care plans is I, I referenced earlier the red IHP book that was written, I don't even know how long ago, but a long, long time ago. And that book really started, for, as, as my understanding, of five or six school nurses that would go out to dinner once a month and they would write a care plan based on someone's case study. And they developed together templates for common conditions. So, and that's how the whole book started. And I, I'm sure they just got to the point where they had 30 or 40 of them and said, why don't we turn this into a book? And so, so, so consider talking to a colleague. If you have a professional development day in your district, consider writing care plans that day and helping each other. So when you need support, I really encourage you to talk to somebody because if you're the, struggling with something, chances are someone else is too. Okay, we're going to turn our attention now to emergency care plans. So, different people define an emergency care plan differently. You might hear emergency action plan. Now, and I, I was talk, I was emailing just today with a school nurse who said she says emergency action plan when it's more of a school overarching plan, and an emergency care plan is more of a student centered plan. And that's what we're going to be talking about is a student centered plan. So an ECP is a document that's written by a school nurse in lay language for non-medical student school staff members to follow. I always like to think about uh, writing something that if someone's really nervous and they've got a piece of paper in their hands and it's shaking, you know, making it so easy to read that they could still do what they needed to do, even though they're shaking with fear. So the emergency care plan is going to outline emergency care. This is based on the orders that you get from the provider, and it's written in lay language. Again, almost a, if you see this, you do this, uh, so that anyone could respond to an emergency. So for the um, em emergency care plan, any child with a severe or life-threatening medical condition that might require adult intervention and oversight during the school day would benefit from an emergency care plan. Now, these are created uh, by the school nurse in cooperation with the parent and the private health care provider. Now, sometimes uh, things like an asthma action plan would more likely come from the provider. But basically, emergency care plans are written by school nurses. And uh, and I think I think, again, you know, we know our school. We know our staff. We know our kids. 
And that's the best reason for us to take that lead role. So basically what the emergency care plan is going to do is provide concrete but very simple training and instructions. So you want to share this with school staff that are acting in any kind of a supervisory role. It's best if you have parent permission to share an an emergency care plan. Most parents, but not all, want everybody to know about their child's health care condition so they can respond if something is needed. However, there is something legally called need to know, and the school determines that. Figure out legally in your state who determines need to know. But in, in, in the state I worked in the most, the school determined who had a need to know. And those people could be legally told about how to respond in an emergency. So what students are your highest priority? Uh, again, the safety of your students with life-threatening health concerns should be your priority. You want to make sure you're providing a safe environment for every student in your school. And again, you want to make sure you're notifying people who have a legitimate need to know and that you're connecting with the family and the students. And again, everybody needs to work hard on developing trusting relationships. Uh, as, uh, parents, you want to make sure that if you call and, and you want to talk to that school nurse, you want to make sure you have developed a trusting relationship. And if and as a school nurse, if you're calling a parent to tell them that there is an emergency and you have developed that 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 intrinsic trust with that parent, they're going to be calmer. They're going to react a more in a, in a more confident way in your care. And that's an important thing. So what goes into an ECP? Again, you're going to have demographics. And, and as I said on the IHP, add that birth date for a little extra security. You're going to have the diagnosis, and that's that medical diagnosis. You want to make sure the name of the health care provider is on there, as well as any additional health issues. And, and you might say, well, why does that need to be on there? But if you're a child who's at risk for anaphylaxis and you have asthma as well, you're at risk for a more severe reaction. So it really helps to have the big picture when someone has a, an additional health issue rather than just the one that you're writing the plan for. You want to make sure that you write down what the emergency signs and symptoms are. What, do you, what is that person supposed to be watching for so that they know when to react? You should have the emergency response, which should be step by step. Uh, don't think like like a nurse when you're writing this. Think like someone who doesn't have that background. And you might even want to have someone review it and say to them, okay, based on this, what would you do? And you might learn something about how you wrote it. Uh, you also want to make sure that you've got emergency contact phone numbers on there. Uh, the, the, the parents used to tease me that I could find them anywhere. But you want to make sure in an emergency that you can find them immediately. But, you know, I would get good like when a child was laying down in my office with a stomach ache and we couldn't find mom. But, of course, this was before cell phones were rampant. But they would say, oh, it's Wednesday? Well, she always goes to her sister's house or she always gets her hair done on Wednesdays. And I called parents at the salon. I called them everywhere. But in an emergency, parents, you want that school to find you. So it's important to make sure that you have great phone numbers in place. So for students with life-threatening allergies that can experience anaphylaxis, and that's that full body allergic reaction, uh, students that are allergic to food, bee sting, latex, uh, medications, there's a whole line of things they could be allergic to. Uh, these are definitely kids that are uh, at needing an ECP because they might need care in response with emergency medication within minutes. Uh, most of us school nurses have been in buildings where we are not always close to every student. It can be a hike to get to some of them, and they might need a response that's quicker than when we can get there. So you want to make sure that you're writing care plans. Uh, and if the, I always thought that if the student had epinephrine prescribed, they had to have an emergency care plan. If there are enough risk to have that epinephrine auto injector, then they really needed to have everybody know how to assist them in the event. And even a student that knows how to self-administer, uh, basically uh, there can be times where something progresses too quickly and they need help. Everyone needs to know how to help them. But with asthma, the range of severity with asthma is a little uh, less um, distinct, shall we say. Uh, some parents, per, students are going to have mild symptoms and some are going to have more severe. Now, I would not write an emergency care plan for a student who uses their inhaler once a year when they run the mile. 
So you want to think about those students that have a history of severe asthma or respiratory distress in certain situations. So not every student with asthma needs to have an emergency care plan, but some of them definitely need one. And this is where you use your good nursing judgment. This is an example of an anaphylaxis emergency action plan. This is just I, this is just the middle section of it. There's uh, demographics above it with the child's name and all that. And then there's the emergency contact numbers below this. But if I put all of that in here, you couldn't read a thing. So I put in the middle of the emergency action plan. And this is from uh, Allergy and Asthma Network. And uh, there's a place to note if they have a history of allergies, history of asthma, and then their triggers, and then their brand name and dose for their epinephrine auto injector. And it's very important that if someone is truly in anaphylaxis, epinephrine is the only standard of practice to be given. It's that first medication that must be given. And so, so that's right here on the uh, emergency action plan. And, uh, and basically there's checks off for if the student knows how to use the auto injector, but it does also acknowledge that they may or may not be able to self-administer. So we have uh, our, our ACE acronym, ACT Immediately, call for help and expect rapid results. So that if some symptoms do not improve within five to 10 minutes, you should be administering a second epinephrine auto injector dose. So that's what you're gonna see in an emergency care plan. And now, so what's everybody's role in developing the emergency care plan? For providers, you want to provide those medical orders again, provide the school with the forms. And I always, as a school nurse, when I wrote the ECP, I then had the parent sign it and the provider. And sometimes when the provider saw the completed emergency care plan, they saw something they wanted to do differently. So you want to make sure you're educating the student and the parent and the family and communicate with the school as needed. School nurses, again, consulting with the provider, the student, and the parent. Write the emergency care plan with input. Keep it simple. And then you want to train staff to administer the plan. And I always encourage everybody to always follow up that training at least every six months. They may never give the epinephrine auto injector to the student, but they also might forget how to if you don't continually uh, retrain. Parents and family, please deliver those needed forms. And when it's a life-saving medication, get that to school first day because you just never know when it's needed. Uh, provide the school with that, those current phone contacts. And another important thing for parents is indicate what hospital you'd like your child go to go to in the event that there is an emergency. Some schools are in the midst of several, and, uh, and you, you, you want to know where they want to know where you want the child to go and then also sign the completed emergency care plan. Next, we're gonna look at section 504 plans. So a 504 is a legally binding plan that's written in lay language. Uh, it ensures that a student with a disability receives accommodations as needed. Um, so basically, this has more teeth in it than uh, an IHP or an ECP. So if a parent is looking to have things uh, in place so a lot of times the Section 504 plan is where they want to go. This is written by a team at school. Uh, most schools have a 504 coordinator, and this formalizes accommodations that are needed to make it through the school. 504 plans, uh, they're part of civil rights law. Some schools love to write them. Some schools don't want them written at all. So you kind of have to figure out what's your culture. Uh, but it, this is, it's, it's to prohibit discrimination against school with disabilities. And it's, it's really intended to uh, remove those barriers to attending school and to learning. So Section 504, basically, it comes down to if something's going to affect being at school or learning, it's covered under Section 504. If you look through this list, that's just about everything. So what are some sample accommodations in the event of food allergy? So in an emergency, uh, accommodations you might write into a 504 plan would be that the student will self-carry epinephrine at all times, or that they'll have access to safe foods in case of a shelter-in-place emergency. There actually are times where kids have to stay at school a lot longer than they expected due to an emergency, and you'd want to make sure they have safe foods. These accommodations are, uh, I, I, uh, I got these from the FANE program. It's the Food Allergy Management Education Program out of St. Louis Children's Hospital. And if you uh, Google 
Fame Food Allergy, you'll find an amazing toolkit. But these are sample accommodations from that toolkit. Transportation accommodations might be that you want to tra train transportation staff on how to respond to food allergy emergencies and not allow uh, food to be eaten on the bus, again, with exceptions for some children that might have health reasons. Classroom accommodations, a, a couple of sample accommodations would be to avoid the use of identified allergens in class projects. Don't use them, have them in parties, and don't use them for rewards. Uh, you want to make sure, too, that there's a mechanism in place to edu educate any substitute, and that would be teacher, paraprofessional, a special area teacher of the child's food allergy. And for celebrations, you'd want to consider celebrations with non-food items, and you want to make sure all desks, tables, chairs are washed with soap and water or approved cleaning products. So uh, FAME outlines what the roles are in 504 plan development. Providers, you want to provide families with paperwork that explains the student's condition. Uh, if there's an emergency action plan or care plan. If school meals or snacks are required, then provide a medical statement stating so, so those can be provided. And outline any needed accommodations. Uh, families really rely on providers for uh, reasonable accommodations in the school setting. A school nurse, can I help identify students that might be eligible for a 504 plan? And you want to make sure that you are uh, gathering required information, including the student's health care plan or uh, emergency care plan if they have one. You want to make sure you're helping to schedule the team planning meeting. And uh, a lot of one school I worked in as a school nurse, I was I was the 504 coordinator. So I had to make sure I got everyone's signatures. Uh, find out again how that works in your school. And parent and family, you can contact your school to refer or request a 504 evaluation for your child. And again, if your child needs school meals, have the doctor complete a medical statement. And the other thing is collaborate on identifying needed accommodations. Sometimes a parent thinks an accommodation is reasonable and needed, but at the same time, uh, they, they might also be uh, suggesting something that just won't work at the school. So again, work together, make sure everybody is on the same page. An individualized education plan. This plan is a written statement of the special education program designed to meet a child's individual needs. An IEP is rarely used for just a health condition because what it really does is outline those special education services that a child needs. But it might be used, let's say, for food allergies if the child had, was learning disabled. They might want to write in um, food allergies as well, because it's a part of the child's uh, school day. So again, shared responsibility. We all have a piece in taking great care of these very wonderful students, the provider, the school nurse, and the parent and the family. Care plans can make a difference. And we go right back to our beginning and we think about second grader Olivia, who was about to have a, an emergency issue, and she would benefit from having a solid plan of care in place. So that teacher is trained and knows how to respond in an emergency. And what we end up with is positive health outcomes. And it helps us all to reach the network's mission of ending the needless death and suffering due to asthma allergy and related conditions, and we do that through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. So at this time, we're going to take some questions, and uh, I, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them. We have a limited amount of time, but, uh, but we'll get to as many as we can. Our first question says, do you have an outline or care plan that you recommend for an allergen exposure prevention plan? Well, that's a great question. Uh, basically, this is not necessarily an individual person's plan. Uh, this would be something that would be more of a school policy of what's the school going to do to uh, prevent allergen exposure. So, so think about that that's not necessarily like an individual plan of care, although you could write some of these prevention strategies into your IHP. Uh, it all depends on, on, on your school and what that student's needs are. But I would think of that more as school policy. And should a school nurse be involved with setting school policy and working on that? Absolutely. 
Uh, one question was, will you send handouts? Uh, we, we don't tend to send out our slides. Uh, m many of our speakers are, um, our researchers and professors that that this is uh, their their intellectual property, but certainly um, there's a lot of, of resources out there, not only on our webpage at allergyasthmanetwork.org, but National Association of School Nurses, which is nasn.org, is another great place for resources. Um, are, do school nurses have access to to um, pollen count and predominant type information on a daily basis. Um, that question, uh, or air quality index. Uh, certainly it's available uh, and, and of course we can all do that better for our students with asthma and we are working on, on some tools that would help nurses be able to understand what the air quality index is on any given day and work towards making sure that they then know how that fits into the care of their students with asthma. So someone wants to know what's the difference between goals and outcomes. Okay, that is really a tough question, and I, I get asked that a lot. A goal, a student goal, is going to be more of an overarching type of thing. You may have a a overarching goal uh, of of the student will have. Uh, uh, you know, uh, improved asthma control. But then the health outcomes will maybe be those smaller pieces of teaching them when to use their inhaler, teaching them how to pay attention to their asthma triggers, and that kind of thing. So the goal is more overarching, and the um, outcome is more the building blocks that get you to your overarching goal. Okay, question. What do you do with non-compliant parents who won't bring in meds or come for medical issues? Okay, and then how do you get them to help with care plans? Well, that is an issue. Uh, certainly, um, uh, we, I, I, I wish I had a dime for every parent that I asked something from that I didn't get. But, but again, developing those trusting relationships, it goes a long way. And when you are, are um, when the parents really see you as someone who's, who's advocating for their child at every, every turn, uh, the, the compliance level does go up. But that being said, uh, like if I had a student who I didn't get the epinephrine auto injector and didn't get it and didn't get it, and that child was going to be going on a field trip, and I, what I would do, you know, I would call the parent. You can't exclude a child from a field trip, but I would certainly uh, talk to them about the the dangers of not having it. And then I used to go to my principal and I would say, "Okay, uh, now I need your help." Uh, I'd try a couple of times, but it was always amazing to me that if the principal called or, or co-signed a letter with me, that came in so fast. So think about asking for some help. And uh, and I don't know why the principal seems to get a whole lot more results than the school nurse. Shouldn't be that way, but trust me, it does work. Okay, so uh, this, la this next question is, we always include all of the teachers in a meeting with our school nurse. Do you recommend this? Sure. Uh, what I, but but you've got to be careful that what you're not doing is talking about individual student health information. You can't disclose to the whole school that Emily Johnson and all the Emily Johnsons. No, I, I don't know one. I'm just picking a name. But you can't you can't say Emily Johnson has anaphylaxis. Let's talk about that. But you can talk to your school about how to respond. You can talk about what does anaphylaxis look like. And uh, and then certainly I would go to school teams and you can't hand out a list of students' health issues. That actually was outlawed in the 70s, but I know nurses that do it to this day. But you can go to a team meeting. You can share information that's a need to know or with parent permission and they can write it down, but you can't hand them a list. Sounds silly, but it's the way the law goes. And, and that's federal laws. That's all confidentiality issues uh, that tied up in FERPA. So, um, so I have time for one more question. Uh, one person says, administration has asked us to provide IHPs for teachers. Do you feel they should only be shared with nurses? Well, I don't want to get you in any trouble with your administrator, but I did not share IHPs, and I would not share IHPs. And the reason being that that teacher does not need to know what your nursing plan of care is. 
They do not need to know what all your interventions are. Certainly at a team meeting, you could talk and say, uh, or you could have a, a conference with the teacher and say, uh, okay, these are the things I'm going to be working on with, with Betsy. And these are the things that are important. But what they really need is that emergency care plan. If it, what we're really concerned about is, will they know what to do in an emergency? And they don't need to have a whole IHP. I also don't recommend attaching an IHP to a Section 504 plan or to an IEP, because both of those plans need to be revised by committee. And if you've got your IHP there and it needs to be that fluid document and you need to change something on it, you'd have to go back to committee. So you want to make sure, what I used to do with the IEPs is I would say um, an individualized health care plan is on file in the nurse's office. And, and that would be attached to the IEP, but not my care plan. So, uh, you know, I hope I don't get you in any trouble with your administrator, but that would be my answer. Okay, well, I am so pleased you chose to spend this, this time uh, today with the Allergy and Asthma Network. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll join us in February. Uh, we're going to have Dr. John Lee from Boston talking to us about taking control of your eczema. And again, providers school nurses and parents, this is a subject that you're going to want to listen to because students with eczema and all people of all ages, they really struggle. And there are some, there's great information that Dr. Lee will share with us. That will be on Tuesday, I mean, Thursday, February 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So you can register for our, fam, our February webinar and you can look at all our archived webinars on our website at www.allergyasthmanetwork.org. Go to the page that says education and right at the top of there on the drop down menu is, is a place for uh, webinars. So basically what you can do there is register for the next webinar and listen to this one or any of the other webinars that we've done. And then I'd like to encourage you to visit our website for quality ed guidelines based resources on allergy and asthma. Also access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on advances, advances in allergy and asthma. This is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We wish you a great and healthy day as we work to breathe better together.